Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're here to discuss managing transitions, a very important topic. And we wanted to give this presentation just for our clients and for their networks of support. So either people that they're gonna be supporting or people that they will have support them. Um, that way we allow our clients to ask your questions um, to our guest speaker today, Susan Hyatt, the CEO and co-founder of Silver Sherpa. And we will be recording this video. So the presentation then will be made public, posted on the Watson Investments YouTube channel after the fact. If anybody would like to contact us, please feel free to reach out. Um, both Sue and myself would love to hear from you. Um, please reach out with your questions or your comments. Our contact details are on the screen here. Sue, what, um, can you tell us a little bit about Silver Sherpa and how you help people? Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. I really enjoy working with you and um, happy to participate in this seminar with your clients and their friends. Um, at Silver Sherpa, we're a professional services company and we focus on uh, planning and coordination services for elderly clients as they make transitions later in life. We also do crisis management and we also work with special needs families. But what we're really looking at is providing professional management services so that people can cope with uh, these transitions later in life because it's at the transition point where things start to break down. Um, families can be, you know, you can do it yourself and often families do, but if you don't have the time and you don't have the expertise, it's better to go to a professional manager who is skilled in this area and who is an independent third party expert. Right. And so what would typically be triggers in people's lives when they really need this extra help? Right. Some of the, the common triggers that we see, there are a couple that are top of the list. Um, and remember, we're in these transition periods. So the first uh, that we see is loss of a partner or loss of a spouse. So often um, we might see older clients that they're living, um, mom and dad are living in their home, they're doing very well. Together as a unit, they're helping each other out. Um, one may have uh, some healthcare issues, but the other one um, is quite mobile and is driving, et cetera. But if there's one, a loss of one uh, member of the team, the other person finds it very difficult to continue. Mm -hmm. So that um, loss of spouse or loss of partner, there might be two sisters living together um, and they're helping each other. Um, and that, or two friends living together and one uh, passes away, then it becomes quite problematic for the other. Um, the other thing that we see is, uh, as a major trigger is a major healthcare event or a major illness. So for example, if someone's diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, and they have a very um, fast onset of symptoms, uh, that can be uh, quite destabilizing and then it creates this transition. Should we live in the bigger home? Should we move to a smaller home or a condo? What's ahead? What does the prognosis look like? That's, um, you know, what's the future looking like? How quickly is the disease going to progress and what kind of care um, and support do we need in the future? So really those are the two big triggers, Jennifer, that we see. Well, thank you for that. And in preparing this presentation, you and I were, were chatting and you told me a story about a family you were helping and how it was suddenly the contingent powers of attorney had to step in and it didn't go as smoothly and it, it wasn't expected that they would all of a sudden have to step in. So would you mind, do you know which story I'm referring to? It's, I do. Okay, it's, would you mind explaining that to the audience then? It's a good story. It's a good way for me to talk to people about powers of attorney because often what we find is that people go through estate planning exercises 
and they get their financial affairs in order and their legal affairs in order. And it's almost like a tick list, you know, well, I've done my will, tick. I've got my powers of attorney in place, tick. But it's that life planning, it's the reality, the devil's always in the details and how family members are going to react and respond. So here's an example, and this actually happened. A gentleman was elderly and he had chronic obstructive lung disease and Alzheimer's. And as we worked with him, and we'd been doing some planning for at least a couple of years with the family, and he and his wife lived together in their home, and she was his caregiver and very active. She was a former nurse, very good at um, coping. It got to a point, though, where he had to go into an assisted living facility because he needed 24-hour care. And it was at that point that he said, and we had the discussions with both he and his wife, if I have to go to hospital and I get pneumonia or I have a stroke or something like that, I do not want to be resuscitated and I do not want to be put on a ventilator to breathe. And he was very direct about that. And he told he and his wife talked about it. They talked to our client director about it. And we knew that those were his wishes. Now, the uh, it so happened that he did get pneumonia and he ended up in the emergency room of a hospital. And uh, both the daughters were uh, were there. Um, the mother had called them. And when the mother got to the emergency room, she fainted and we weren't sure whether she'd had a stroke or what was happening. So she got taken to another part of the emergency room and there were the two daughters who were the alternate powers of attorney, but they were joint. So the emergency room physician said to them, dad, it's confirmed he has pneumonia. If we don't treat him, he will probably die. And so one daughter said to the emergency room physician, and remember their joint powers of attorney, one daughter said, if you treat my father and treat his pneumonia, I will sue you and the hospital. And the other daughter said to the emergency room physician, if you don't treat my father, I will sue you and the hospital. My father wants to be treated at all cost. And so here we were in a situation and our client director told the physician that the client's wishes were not to be treated. However, his wife was not there to back it up. The physician went away, talked to his colleagues, they came back, they made the decision to treat the gentleman. So he was treated for his pneumonia, he ended up in intensive care and he was ventilated for three months until his death. That is not what he wanted, but because the powers of attorney were joint, the daughters were joint powers of attorney, they did not agree. So the physician, the emergency room doctor had to make a decision and under the hospitals act, they can do that. And so they made the decision to treat the gentleman. Well, thank you so much, Sue. So how do you think we could, how could these two sisters and this family really have avoided this situation? Uh, good question, Jennifer. And that's the part about planning ahead and stepping back with your families and making a decision um, to inform people about what's going on and what your wishes are. So in this case, we had quite a bit of runway with this gentleman. You know, we'd, we'd, worked, with the, we'd worked with he and his wife um, for the, I would say for about 18 months before this episode, we'd done a thorough plan session with them. We'd help them uh, navigate the various systems to find appropriate doctors. We'd help them find appropriate assisted living. We costed that out with their financial managers um, and their planners. So we'd, we'd spent a lot of time, but what they didn't do and they didn't want to do was involve the daughters. And the reason being is that the daughters didn't get along. They were like chalk and cheese. They couldn't even stay in the same room together. 
So the family made the, the mom and dad made the decision not to involve the daughters, but yet there they were as the alternates on the power of attorney. And even worse, there they were as joint decision makers when they couldn't stay in the same room together. So, it, you know, it begs the question, number one, um, go through a scenario. This is what we do with our clients. We plan out these scenarios and a realistic scenario. Um, in that case was what happens, dad, if you get pneumonia, what do you want? Um, so he'd gone through that scenario with his wife, but not with the daughters. So it's that full communication and then document it, write it down. Um, and then if you need an independent facilitator to help you have the family discussion, because some families, you do need someone from outside to sort of get the conversation going. Um, and you know, this uh, when we do these kinds of conversations with families, it doesn't need to be doom and gloom. You know, it, we don't hang black crepe on the windows to talk about this stuff. It can be done in a very reasonable way. People can um, have a discussion. They can, um, you know, we facilitate the parents or the daughters or the sons being able to ask questions. Um, and it's in many cases, our clients say that it's it's like a, a, a rock off their shoulders because they're able to talk about this, but use a third party to have the conversations. When you get to be 70 or 80, you, you want to be able to sort of sit down and say, okay, with your family, you want to set the table and say, these are the kinds of things that I'd like. These, this is, you know, I've done my funeral pre-planning and by the way, I want to be buried or I want to be cremated or I want to do this um, because our families have different opinions. Um, I've got two children, they don't get along, they never have and they never will. Um, one of them's a business person and um, is a, um, a diversity expert and the other one's a pediatric oncologist. They have very different views of death, of what happens, of what mother might want. Um, well, so conversation's critical. And, and even if the children, adult children were saved, just, we're using these examples. It is the most common to have your spouse and then your adult children. It's just a common theme we see for beneficiaries, um, for powers of attorney, executors, and then contingents. So even if though two people do get along, they still could have very different emotional views with how to handle if one of their parents, let's say, is ill or the, how, one of, how we should finance one of those expensive care programs or something like that. So, so you're saying then conversation, open communication are kind of some of the ways that we can, we can help and exactly. hopefully alleviate these issues. And we go through this life planning process. This is the next thing is that we need to plan these things out. Just like you plan for marriage, you plan for babies, you plan for your kids' education, you plan for retirement. Well, you need to plan for end of life. And we need to get through this sort of feeling of, oh, this is icky, it's doom and gloom. It doesn't need to be. So at Silver Sherpa, we empower our clients to plan and to have some fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is it you want? You want to be in control. Um, the next thing, there's, there's some debates that we have. We do a lot of work in the estates court. We get called in as an independent third party expert. And I have debates with, with the estate planning lawyers a lot about these things because having spent almost a decade working with families and working through these very difficult situations and also working with families that are pretty easy to work with. Um, it's pretty clear to me that if you have one power of attorney, it's a good idea for personal care. If you start adding more people and they're not joint and several and they're joint, 
the two daughters, the example I mentioned, then you've got two people. Now the rules are in hospital that if you're going to do something that light is life altering, life threatening, um, as people crassly say, pull the plug, both those people have to be there in front of the doctor and because they have to verify that you are who you say you are. And they won't act unless both agree if that's what the power of attorney says. So there's a reality check here in that most of the time, given our healthcare system today, and given how things have rolled out and look at COVID, that's shone the spotlight on a very fragmented and um, disrupted system. It's better to have one person having to make the decision and dealing with the medical community. So I would argue, think long and hard about that. This is not a popularity contest. You know, if Susie's feelings are hurt because Betty Jane is the power of attorney for personal care, that's unfortunate, but it could save you some difficulty down the road. So it's better to think through these things. Mm -hmm. And also, does the person that you appoint, do they have the personal fortitude and stamina to be able to cope with some of these very gut-wrenching decisions if they were to happen? Mm -hmm. And so talking about communication, like one of the things that we've helped clients with is in terms of if you want to gift money in advance um, throughout life, um, you know, how much do you want to even help your ch adult children as they grow up? And are you going to give them money for a down payment? Or are you not? And there's one, there's the financial side, like, can you afford to do this while still maintaining your lifestyle and your choices? Then there's the other, you know, is this philosophically the right thing that you want to do? And do you even want to tell your adult children how much money you have and what your assets really are? Um, children of all ages, we find they often, they don't see exactly what their parents probably have. And it's, we think differently. So from the financial perspective, that's a huge conversation of when do you actually disclose that if ever to your beneficiaries. Now, from the healthcare perspective, you're saying one of the great, like best ways to almost avoid conflict and to actually have our wishes implemented is to communicate about it. So at what stage in people's lives, at what age of their, you know, powers of attorney, like how, what are kind of some of those metrics or ways to think through when we should actually be starting these conversations? And, and it's going to obviously vary from family to family. It, it's um, our approach to it, Jennifer, is to customize it to each individual. So we're a professional group that works with the family and every family's different. There is no cookie cutter approach. If somebody gives you a tick list and says, this is the way to do this, I'm not so sure they've been there, done that. Um, this is not easy stuff and every family's different. So a couple of scenarios to think about. One would be, uh, we deal with families who um, have resources and also, also with families who have very high net worth. So some people don't want to disclose and, and that's fine. But what I would encourage you to do from a financial management perspective is to at least put aside monies for care costs. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, you may never use them. But I, I personally want to now what I know after decade, a decade in the business, I'm going to put aside and my husband and I have put aside um, a, a, a pocket or a, a, an amount of money that is to be used for care costs. And it's large. So let me give you some examples. Um, dementia care, that's one thing that you'll hear a lot more about. And um, many of you know the Sunrise communities you've seen if you're in the Oakville or, or Mississauga areas or Burlington, you see Sunrise of Oakville, Sunrise of Burlington. Uh, they tend to be high-end care. Um, and for someone uh, who is at a Sunrise, the average care costs 
probably run, depending on the care, around twelve to thirteen thousand dollars per month. Now, my own mom. I'll give you an example. Anecdote was at Sunrise of Oakville on the lower end of the care costs as her Alzheimer's evolved. And for eight years, she was at Sunrise and it was just over $500,000 in costs before we transferred her to long-term care because she needed more nursing care. Mm -hmm. So think about these costs are, are quite heavy mm -hmm. if you need that type of care. So number one, don't give all your money away to your kids because yeah. you may need it. Number two, you, it may be a lot more costly than what you think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's important to plan this out. What type of care would you like? Do you want to be um, kept in a, you know, do you want to go to a place that is comfortable for you? It's got high-end furniture, it's got staff around the clock, it's got good food and good wine. Is that what you want? Or are you okay with going to a smaller place that perhaps is out of the city, a little bit cheaper, but bigger gardens mm -hmm. um, and a little bit cheaper? And we need to be able to cost those things out and give you a realistic um, cost. The other cost we need, to, uh, we should talk about is home care costs, because you're going to hear a lot about, you know, everybody wants to stay in their home. Everybody wants to age at home. Okay, talk to us about this, because it can be a very costly exercise when you start needing heavier care. So PSWs, personal support workers, in the Oakville Burlington area right now. And these are people with minimal training. They're not nurses. They're personal support workers who help you with your shower, maybe make lunch, provide companionship, might do the grocery shopping, $35 per hour minimum. And there's a minimum three hours per day. So you're looking at costs if you need 24 hour care in the home, you're looking at about $28,000 per month. Mm -hmm. That's expensive. It is, yes. And there, I mean, there is definitely ways we look at cash flow projections always for clients. Um, most often we don't include the house in terms of a cash flow perspective. Um, there's ways that you can have home equity line of credit to grab capital from the house. There's tons of ways of planning and looking at this and also planning for scenarios where maybe one person wants or needs to go to a home and one person wants to stay in the home with care. So there's um, these are lots of things we have to think about and then lots of different scenarios that we can run from the financial perspective as well to make sure that it's feasible and just the flexibility and the options are there. And, and from a tax planning perspective too, Jennifer, we should mention that this is why we work with the financial manager. We don't like um, a situation where we're called in to help a family, but there's no financial manager or advisor because this is complicated. Um, the tax planning side of this gets complicated. When do you get a disability tax credit or when can you apply for one? This is a back and forth between um, our financial team that we're working with and us saying, well, look, you know, we're not at that point yet, but within six months, you should be able to apply for a disability tax credit, which then will offset some of the, um, it's a credit that you can offset income. And this year it's worth about $8,500. Um, but these are very technical things that require yes. um, the advice of people that know how to do these things because it's a combination of medical uh, planning, financial, tax planning, etc. cetera. Um, and a lot of families don't take advantage of this. I'm very surprised at the number of families um, who do not have good financial advice. They haven't had these discussions with their their um, management team or 
they're use, uh, you know, uh, people say, well, why don't the accountants tell me about that? But accountants don't necessarily recommend these things. That's another silo. Yeah, accounts um, are separate. Yeah, they, they do often get, people get uh, confused, I think, with the roles of the advisor versus the accountant, but they all have different roles that need to play their part for sure. Uh, so we'd like to ask the audience now, um, where you'd like us to go next in the conversation. So we're going to put up a poll on the screen. And if you'd like to just take a moment and select which thing, which item you'd like uh, Sue to explain next. So the options are, you know, how do we choose a power of attorney for care? What are advanced care directives? And what does this really mean? And then more about end of life planning, which will include advanced care directives as one of the options. So if uh, everyone could just uh, select your most preferred next topic, that would be really helpful. And we'll close the poll in just a moment. As well, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And as we go um, throughout the next half hour, we're able to answer the questions as they come up. Okay, and when we have uh, the votes are in, we can close up that poll. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it looks like the middle topic. So what advanced care directives, what, so what are advanced care directives? What does this really mean? So Sue, if you could tell us about that next, that would be great. Okay. Um, I see that and then uh, closely followed by POA for care. So let's, let's talk about advanced care directives first. Um, advanced care directives are, um, it's, it, it's a term that's used for specific wishes that you would like to see um, for advanced care, particularly um, at end of life. But advanced care directives can also be used um, as someone goes into the palliative stages of life. So let me give you an example. An advanced care directive, um, the most common one that you will hear about is a DNR or a do not resuscitate order. Um, and often when someone goes into an assisted living facility, on entry, when you go there, there will be a conversation about what are your wishes. And you'll be asked about, um, do you have specific advanced care directives? And do you wish to have a DNR, which is a do not resuscitate order? Now, people find this very difficult to talk about. Some people talk to their physicians about it, but it's something that we've learned we need to have written down. We need to give specifics about these things. So let me give you an example of a patient or a client of ours with multiple sclerosis who lives in her home, but um, she has become more and more uh, debilitated, but is still doing okay at home. Her wishes are, that should she have a heart attack or should she have a medical event which requires 911, she does not want to be resuscitated. So she has a form on her fridge that she was able to get from the Halton paramedics that says very clearly, um, I do not want to be resuscitated. And that's a form that's filled out, it's a legal form and it uh, sits on her fridge. Um, so that's a type of advanced care directive. Uh, the example of going into the, um, the retirement home or the assisted living home again, um, on entry, uh, there's this discussion. And do you want to be resuscitated or not? The fact of the matter is, and the medical facts around this are, 
that if you are frail and older, and let's say you've got osteoporosis, you're in your 80s, if you were to have a medical event that requires 911 to be called, CPR or the cardiopulmonary resuscitations would probably break most of your ribs as a frail 85 year old or 90 year old. So it's something that people think about and at a certain stage, either the individual or their power of attorney for care, say advanced care directives, we want this documented. We do not want mom or dad to be resuscitated. Um, so I'll give you another example of an advanced care directive. Um, feeding tubes. Often now in hospital, when people get towards end of life and they're not feeding or taking nutrition. Um, and sometimes even in long-term care, doctors will recommend a feeding tube be put in the stomach and the person be fed liquid through the tube. Mm. That's something that's a very personal decision. And me personally, if I'm at that stage, I don't want a feeding tube. And so if you don't have these things written down, if they're not specific as a directive and it's not documented somewhere for your power of attorney for personal care, it could be left to someone else's uh, decision, like a doctor. That's all. Well, and that's also a lot of pressure. I mean, being a power of attorney for someone you, for anyone and for someone you love and so close to it, it's a hard enough job on it, it on its own. So you're almost being nice by giving those parameters and direction of saying like, you don't need to make these decisions. You follow right. these directions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So powers of attorney for personal care, we're back to that discussion because who uses advanced care directives? It will be that power of attorney for personal care if you are unable to speak for yourself. And so chances are, in these circumstances, you may not be able to speak for yourself. So who will act for you? It will be that power of attorney for personal care. Who will point to these advanced care directives and say to the doctors or you know, the paramedics or whatever situation you're in, these are the advanced care directives and here is what this says. And so a question came in around that. So how should we best document these directives so that they're actually legally binding? There's, so here is the, I am not a lawyer and there's a lot of debate about this, but here is what's happening in reality. So people sometimes now, some lawyers are documenting and adding the advanced care directives as an addendum to the power of attorney for personal care. So in other words, you're my power of attorney, and by the way, these are the advanced care directives specific, and they addend it to write to um, the power of attorney for personal care. Some lawyers still uh, put wording inside the actual power of attorney document. But here's the issue with that. Um, many of the doctors in intensive care and in emergency rooms and in the trauma rooms don't like the wording that's in there because it's too vague. So I'll give you an example. We see often powers of attorney that have not been updated and they say things like uh, no heroic measures. If you go to a trauma surgeon and ask them what that means or an intensive care specialist and ask them what that means, they can't define that anymore. We don't know what, there's no basket of things that we can define as no heroic measures. So you need to be more specific about these things and either um, embed it in the power of attorney document or addend, put an addendum um, and speak with your lawyers about that. 
Now, um, there are some folks who want to get even more detailed, and there are literally toolkits for advanced care directives that you can work through. And we have some of those that we work through with clients. And they're literally a toolkit that says, if this happens, you want this. If this happens, this is how you want this to unfold. Um, so some people feel, you know, that they want to do that. Um, this is all about you making your own decisions and having control about what you want at mm -hmm. end of life. And, it, you know, none of us have a, a crystal ball, right? We could be in an accident tomorrow. And if you don't have these things written down, then your power of attorney is in a situation where they have to make decisions and sometimes very difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for answering that. Um, is there anything else around the advanced care directives or power of attorney we wanna to get to before I go to the next question? Um, let's just talk a little bit about power of attorney for personal care. Um, I find that a lot of people, Jennifer, when they first come to us, they sort of have done a little bit of reading, but they think power of attorney for care is only about making decisions around medical care. And that is not true. So if you look at the legislation around power of attorney for personal care, that person that you appoint or persons are responsible for everything except your assets and your property. So what food do you eat? What clothes you wear? How many times you get a bath per week? Where you live? Who you communicate with? That's all the power of attorney for personal care unless you can speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. So property looks after finances, assets, managing the assets, payment of bills, not these other things. So what you have to think about is we see lots of examples where the often the eldest daughter is made the power of attorney for personal care. So she's going to have to make decisions and let's say dad passes and mom is alive, but mom has Alzheimer's and now is dependent. So daughter is making those personal care decisions. Where does mom live? What does mom eat? Who are her companions? Right down to whether she gets a vaccination for COVID or not. The son often is made the power of attorney for property. Mm -hmm. And we've had several mediation situations where we've been involved, where the daughter has chosen an assisted living or dementia care facility, and the son has refused to allow mom to go there because he says it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had people say to me, well, even though there are resources, I don't want mom to go there. That's too expensive. That's $13,000 a month. And as the power of attorney for property, my job is to preserve wealth for the next generation. I've actually had people say that to me mm -hmm. who are professional people who know better. So I, I think we need to think long and hard, all of us, about power of attorney for personal care, typically it doesn't have money attached to it. So maybe you wanna think about this in the future and say, well, this person would be my power of attorney for personal care, but they have access to these designated funds for my care. Hmm. And the power of attorney for property agrees. So we need to look at this in a much different way now because we're seeing a lot of these situations. And by the way, that's, that's a typical litigation case in court that we're seeing as well, where you know, then the powers of attorney go to court, they litigate, and that turns into a, another whole situation. Uh, now, would you ever recommend that somebody have the same power of attorney? 
for both? Yes, that that often happens in some families. Um, it, and the benefit there is um, it's the same person who is working with a financial management group. The ideal is they're working with a financial management group on the property side. So they're still getting assistance. They're working on the care side with a team that really does understand this. And as long as there's disclosure and everybody's open about what's going on and what the costs are, then the siblings or the other beneficiaries can take comfort as long as there's a light shone on everything that yes, these are good decisions. This is what we want for mom or dad. Where trouble starts is where people might be the power of attorney for both personal care and property, but they hide everything. They don't tell the siblings or the cousins what are going on. So people start to think, well, gee, if they're not talking about it, maybe there's a problem or why did they make that decision? Right. So you want to shine light on this so that you don't run into difficulties with potential beneficiaries or family members saying, well, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. So one of the things that we have at our office is a trusted contact form. It's a document that this is basically giving us permission. So our clients will choose somebody and gives us permission to actually reach out to that person if we ever think that there's maybe something going on and we want to just get a second opinion. So this is at a stage that would be before any powers of attorney are actually implemented. This is um, some behaviors not seeming right or their language is suddenly changed. And we know our clients so well that this is triggering us that we just want to go reach out to somebody on their behalf and make sure everything's okay. So that's the trusted contact form. Um, one of the questions that has come in is, so what would you recommend or what should you consider for a power of attorney for finances and property? So if the individual is still living, when does financial responsibility shift to the power of attorney? So maybe this can kind of be answered by both of us maybe. But Sue, do you want to kick us off for that answer? Good question. So um, I have issues with the trusted contact if there's an active power of attorney for personal care. Why? Because we've seen the other side of this where the trusted contact and the power of attorney for personal care don't agree. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at the end of the day, if there is a care issue, the legal authority is the power of attorney for personal care. So I, um, it depends on the situation. So that's one thing to consider. Um, however, if the personal care, power of attorney for personal care is out of town and they don't have eyes on, but a trusted neighbor does or a trusted member from the church does or the minister is the trusted contact, then that's different. So it's very individual and we are careful because we've, we've seen the extreme in both cases. Now let's talk about property. <laughs> um, property is um, linked to capacity. So, and capacity is a very uh, different thing to different people. It's very hard to determine when you actually lose capacity, unless there's a catastrophic event. Um, and often what we're dealing with are dementias, but it's a moving target. Because let's say someone's diagnosed with moderate dementia. It's quite feasible that in the morning, they can do quite well. But in the afternoon, they become tired and they're more confused. So capacity is a moving target. And it, um, I guess the ideal thing would be if you work with your family and if you notice that you're changing and you're having cognitive difficulties, 
Like for example, we have a client right now who's um, got cancer, he's got leukemia, and he's been doing just fine uh, up until about six weeks ago. And he noticed that in reading his financial statements with his financial advisor, that he couldn't keep up. And he noticed that when he started trying to reconcile statements, he couldn't do the math. And that's the first time that he's ever noticed that. But his mm -hmm. oncologist told him that eventually the chemotherapy was going to alter his ability um, on these executive functions. So we've now, we met with him. I actually met with him on the weekend and now he's transferred the banking and the paying of bills and all of that to his wife. And we've been working with his wife for the last six months and the financial manager preparing for this day when we knew this was going to happen. So he's got a shifting capacity right now. He hasn't turned over everything um, in terms of only the power of attorney can write checks, which is his wife, but he's, he's realized that he's sliding into that situation um, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to have those kinds of open discussions and you want to talk to your financial managers. I mean, these are the discussions, Jennifer, that are absolutely critical um, from your office. That once, once we know that this is an, you know, it's a possible scenario, um, we want to have those conversations earlier rather than later. Yeah, and I mean, it's very, it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice. Uh, it's too bad that this has happened to your client, um, but they have been also given a little bit of a gift of time and it's overtime and they knew this was coming, whereas we don't always have that gift of time. So, I mean, one of the things for us is we're always really encouraging is that if you are in a relationship, it's both parties come to the table for our financial discussions. It's, um, we're starting to really introduce um, the idea of last pass in our meetings with clients. This is one of our, our newer initiatives. And it's the idea of, yeah, if something happens to you, you need, someone needs to know where to go to pay the bills, the passwords to get into everything. So how do we keep that organized and, and keep that communication flowing. And then also is, you know, when do you start to introduce your powers of attorney to your financial planner? I mean, I think at a minimum, you just want them to know this person exists, this is their card, this is who you call. And, you know, we've, um, we've worked with many clients, power of attorneys over, you know, 30 years of operations, and we're able to just help them and we know what their wishes are. And we help and kind of hold the powers of attorney's hand to work through everything that de deals with finance, which enters the realm of personal care, of course, they're completely connected. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, thank you for answering that question. And there's another, there's another question that's come in. So if two daughters have both power of attorney for personal care and for property for their mother, their father passed away, and the daughters have a history of not agreeing with each other, is there someone who could be retained as a mediator between the two daughters? Um, yes, we do a lot of work like this um, where there are two daughters and um, if the parent chose the two daughters because they felt, um, usually it's family dynamics that parents say, no, there have to be both of them on the ticket. Um, then we do do a lot of facilitation work with families. Um, so what that would look like is first there needs to be a plan. They, if they're not getting along, we would work with them independently. Um, we do this with families, but we also do this with the estate's court. So that's some of the work that we do with the court where if it does end up in litigation, they ask us to come in as the independent third party facilitator and work with the family members until the um, elderly person's death. Um, so it is, it, we are able to facilitate. What we do is go back to 
focus on not the disagreements, but let's go back and focus on what mom wants or what dad wants, mm -hmm. because all of these efforts should be focused on the client mm -hmm. and mom's the client in this situation. So we want to focus there on mom, do the assessments, establish what care criteria are necessary for mom, talk to the doctors, talk to the caregivers, talk to the people around her, talk to each of the daughters independently, talk to other family members, and then put that assessment all together and present it to both daughters as here's all the information in a cohesive assessment. Now here are the, the criteria on which mom needs to go forward. And here's what we need right now. And six months from now, here's what mom might need. And a year from now, and then go back to you as the financial manager, Jennifer, because those care needs will change mm -hmm. as life goes on and the costs may change. So there come the cost factors. And if the daughters don't get along, if there's no plan, it will just be a, um, a difficult um, situation. Whereas if you have a plan, and you know what the range of costs is going to be today. And then six months from now, based on those care criteria, what the costs are tomorrow, you have a plan that you can sit down and work with people to sort this out. If you don't have that kind of process and plan in place, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, an, that's definitely helpful, I think, just remembering what the, the person who you're trying to help really wants. And again, if they can have as much information given to and expressed in advance, that also can help. Um, and then the conflict between siblings is sometimes just something that's there. So it sounds like yep. you have a lot of resources though that can potentially help kind of mitigate this. We do, and we're okay, using the mm -hmm. so It's it's unfortunate that there are disputes, um, but you know it, it makes sense to because stresses are high, and even if you did get along once upon a time ago, it's it's a stressful period of time trying to help and help your loved ones. So, yeah, yeah, and uh, so you. Sorry, mm -hmm. I sorry. Just... Go ahead to the audience, you know, I think um, what you don't want to do is end up in a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to call us on the Saturday morning at 10 a.m. going, Sue, uh, we, we meant to plan, but now we're in a crisis. Mom's broken her hip. Dad can't stay at home alone. He wanders with his, his dementia or whatever. Um, and we're, we're in Vancouver and can't make it back. You don't want to be in a crisis because the vectors you're going to have to deal with are time, money, expertise, and a lot of stress. And so if you can anticipate that and work with that before you get into a crisis and work with your parents or work with your family members or your special needs family members, um, that's the ticket. Uh, don't leave it to do it yourself. And then all of a sudden you're, you're drowning and you need help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's why, I mean, you know, on the financial planning priorities, which is something that all of our clients watching right now know about, but we list, you know, who is your power of attorney? Who's your contingent power of attorney? Who's your executor? Who's your contingent? And also then the beneficiaries on the accounts and contingent for those as well, if that applies. And it's, it's important to always bring it front of mind because our circumstances do change. And when we do our will, we often, we do it, we put it away and it's often can be forgotten, but it shouldn't be forgotten. It's, it's something that's constantly evolving, needs to be looked at. You know, um, our power of attorney, maybe they move out of Ontario it's not a good person anymore so we need to change that and bring attention to it and then it goes clearly so much deeper beyond that is what you've really shown us today through your various stories so 
we're uh, we have just a few more minutes left. So Sue, is there uh, maybe one more key takeaway that the audience should be aware of? You've, I mean, you've mentioned tons of things to me offline about the smart aging plan that you have at Silver Sherpa. So is there anything else in there that you can kind of give us as those, those final moments of takeaways? Well, I think a big takeaway for our clients and um, we do a lot of, of these types of seminars, Jennifer, and what we're really recommending now is to think about smart aging. Think about, and I think COVID has shone the spotlight on how difficult things can really get in the healthcare system, particularly with a, um, a healthcare crisis. So if you're in your 40s or 50s, it's time to think about, you know, what's my plan? I need to get all these ducks in a row. And it's something that we have a smart aging audit that's fun to do that a lot of people are taking advantage of. And it goes into some of these things that we've talked about and some of these key scenarios. Um, it's not just your elderly parents. We have a lot of folks who call us after they've been divorced um, or their elder uh, people who are going to be on their own. They don't have children of their own um, and they really don't have anyone close and they're not sure about powers of attorney. So it's never too early to plan for these things. So, and business owners, um, same thing, you know, uh, planning ahead is really critically important. So it's a good idea to get these audits done and just have a very simple plan. Here's where everything is, but it's on, it's what you do on the financial side. It's what we do on the life side. Um, right down to where are your glasses uh, prescriptions, who's your optometrist, where are all your, your um, uh, pharmacy prescriptions, those kinds of things, because all of those activities are important to us. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of things to consider. So it, it goes way beyond just the passwords. It's, yeah, where is the medication, the prescriptions, everything. So lots of things to do and, and lots of ways that we can definitely get organized. So thank you so much, Sue. Um, this has been very interesting, very informative. And uh, we're gonna put our contacts back up on the screen. But if anybody would like to reach out to either myself, uh, anyone on the Watson Investments team or Sue or anyone on her team, uh, we're more than welcome to have a call, email communication, whatever is your preferred method. So please reach out to us with any follow-up questions, um, any more resources that you'd like. We'd, we'd really enjoy hearing from you. And this um, session was recorded, so it will be on our YouTube channel. So you can search Watson Investments on YouTube and get that recorded copy. It'll be up in about a week or so. And um, you're able to also then share that with your loved ones and friends. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sue, for your time today. That was very interesting, very informative. And thank you very much for all the questions that came in that really added a lot of value to our discussion today. Thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your day.